they know what they want. Uh, and then they depend on their advisors to work out. Like right now, Trump's circle is working out this very scary plan. The way will John. Everybody, welcome back to another wonderful podcast. Today we have the great Ruth Ben Gyat. Ruth, how you doing? I'm well. I'm pleased to be speaking with you. That's great. That's great. Lot to get into as we were talking about before we got on here. Um, everybody's going to have a, a very, let's say, interesting outlook on the current events of the world right now. And you have a unique position given that you've been studying this for quite some time. So if you could just give us a good understanding and background of how you know so much on this subject um, and uh, what you're all about, essentially. Yeah, thanks. So I grew up in Southern California, uh, very far away from, uh, you know, fascism and all this. And um, the town I grew up in, Pacific Palisades, uh, was a place where a lot of famous uh, intellectuals fled uh, from Nazism. So like famous writers like Thomas Mann and composers, all kinds of people. So I kind of grew up hearing about these people, uh, although I had no family connection. My mom's from Scotland. My dad's from the Middle East. Uh, I'm first generation. So I didn't hear about uh, Hitler too much or anything like that. But so my math teacher at high school was the son of one of these famous refugees, Arnold Schoenberg, the composer. So anyway, I learned about these people. And then I went to UCLA and I decided I was still interested. And long story short, I decided to focus on Italian fascism because there really wasn't as much done. Mussolini was the first fascist and he came in years before Hitler. He was a role model for Hitler. Hitler worshiped him. Um, he, then Hitler invaded him later on. But, um, and so, <laughs> And so, and it lasted twice as long as Nazism. So basically I, my career, I was studying Italian fascism. And so it was like, that's history, but I'm a historian. And then, um, you know, later years, right? Uh, all of this starts to come back after the Cold War ends and the fall of communism meant that the right wing, the radical right wing could flourish. Uh, and first in Italy, Berlusconi brings, you know, neo-fascists into the government for the first time since 1945. Uh, I'm in Italy. I see, like, people doing, like, fascist salutes again. I'm like, what's going on? So that's, that's how I decided I should. I had the skill set. I had the knowledge to speak out. Um, and so from about 2016, I've been doing extensive, uh, you know, public interface to educate people and dialogue with people about what's going on. And you had some, let's say, uh, forethought or foresight on what potentially could happen, you know, if Trump was to become elected, right? And I've seen a lot of your 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 talks yeah. and you're very you're very busy, I can I can okay. tell doing doing all that you do. And uh, you speak about something called the authoritarian playbook. Something yeah. that uh, most autocrats use in order to gain power, consolidate power, uh, you know, push their agenda. Could you explain what that is exactly? Yeah. So when Trump started, um, I again, I'm a, a scholar of uh, foreign politics, let's say, not just Italy, but and then I never uh, did much study of American history. My parents aren't American, and of course, I was interested because I grew up here, but. Um, I saw Trump come on the scene and he started to do all the things that were recognizable to me from my studies of fascism. Uh, so we had rallies, this, we're talking like 2015, 16 rallies where he had, uh, he made people take loyalty oaths. So that's one element of the authoritarian playbook is leader cults and the nature of the bonds of politicians who have leader cults is very different. Uh, those people are bonded to him, again, by loyalty, by love. He tells them he loves them. And it's very difficult to break those bonds after. And, and then immediately targeting the press, trying to turn public opinion against the press, because all these guys are corrupt. And so a lot of them run for office while they're under investigation. So that was Trump. 
uh, Netanyahu, Putin, Berlusconi. So these are like patterns. And my book, Strongman, is about having these patterns. So basically, uh, I saw that uh, Trump was kind of activating all of these, what I call them in my book, tools of rule. So corruption, violence, and of course, he's, he's not doing what the fascists did, right? But uh, threatening violence, eventually with January 6th, um, propaganda, and the myth of national greatness, that they are the saviors of the nation. Uh, I alone can fix it, right? Um, and they all pose as the saviors of the nation. So those are some of the elements of the authoritarian playbook. And what I find fascinating, obviously, in drawing um, any sort of commonality from all of these leaders and what they're what they're doing there is this weird bromance yet you know thing with with putin and trump uh and it was very hard actually to understand the dynamic there on one hand you can see that trump respects putin in some sense or likes what he has per, but potentially and then and, you know me I, I speak russian and uh although i've never been to russia i'm quite tuned in to that world um and you know what you get on the other end is this kind of mocking sometimes of Trump as if he's a little puppet yes. of, of Putin's at, at that time. Right. Yes. And so there was this weird dynamic. I couldn't really, I, I don't understand what it is and what's going on. And so I'd love to know what your take yeah. is on the relationship between them and how they, you know, flourished. Yeah, actually, I can't believe I forgot this because it's very central. So it's corruption, violence, propaganda, national greatness and machismo. And my book is the first book to have a chapter on masculinity. And it goes from Mussolini and Hitler up to Trump and Putin, uh, because it often these kind of bromances and the idea of machismo is not taken seriously. So you see Putin, you know, posing like puffing up his pectorals, um, pose, you know, they pose without shirts. Um, there's this whole like machismo now among Republicans in the U.S., and you can think, oh, that's just them being silly, but it's actually deadly serious because the idea of the leader as uh, infallible, omnipotent, more powerful than anyone and untouchable. And they use, like certainly Putin uses, there's a reason like since the war started uh, on Ukraine, dozens of elites have died in suspicious circumstances. So they use threats, they use violence and repression to to keep to keep this personality cut going that says that no one can touch them that they are all powerful so in terms of trump and putin I, of course i watched this really really uh, closely and i didn't um when they met in helsinki i think it was 2018 uh, correct me if i'm wrong i did a piece for cnn on the images that came out and the body language and it was super interesting for what you just said because Trump, of course, is the master of his domain, right? That's why people love him. Men and women love him. He's all powerful. He, he's always like dominating any space he's in. Well, with Putin, who is his patron in various ways um, at the time, uh, for sure, his body language was like he was kind of hunched over. His gaze went downward. He was not his normal uh, blustery like macho self. And I thought that was super interesting and very revealing. So these strong men, there's different pairs of this. Like the first pair was Mussolini and Hitler. And one of them inevitably, so that's super interesting because at the beginning it was Mussolini who had the success and Hitler actually had a bust of Mussolini on his desk because he was so in love with him. And his, this is 1920s, so Hitler like, was kind of a loser at the time, and he, he was trying right, to get into right. power. And these fellow Nazis were making fun of him because he was like, you know, worshiping Mussolini. And then later the tables turned. And so there's this way that these strong men use their masculinity. There's a famous picture of uh, Putin and Modi walking, holding hands. Now, this is pre-pandemic, right? But Putin is not an expressive person emotionally. So that was Modi, but Putin consented to do it to show that they had this bond. So the macho bond of these guys is very important to their public image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and yet, and yet the, 
when there's a patron client relationship and uh, the leader wants to show that somebody is his subordinate, not only he knows how to do that, that's also the television where Trump was mocked by Kremlin television prime time as being a Putin puppet. That's the ultimate, right? And I think that like Trump supporters here in the States, who many of them uh, were and are pro-Putin, they didn't really know what to do about that or what to do with that. <laughs> yeah, that seems like, yeah, it's this conflicting information that they kind of, but the whole situation and just at large, I mean, I can't fault obviously the average citizen for being confused by the current uh, world of trying to find truth and do a, a you know make an analytical and proper decision on you know who and what is correct and right uh in certain things obviously some things just seem clearly boldly wrong but i i wanted to ask because i'm what i'm really getting at is why is this appealing to men now and not just to men but uh, mm -hmm. to a greater you know the greater society does it have something to do with the 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 rhetoric uh where it currently seems to be that there is this misbelief in government that the past that we're learning about a lot of uh, things that the government potentially may have lied about and and all of this stuff and there's some sort of uh, there's almost a crusade uh, against government and it's somewhat bipartisan in its in its in its push but that the I would say that the right and say people like Trump capitalize on by saying the media's always lying they're always this and there is that current sentiment maybe bubbling up on both sides where that moderate person can look to somebody and say, well, yeah, you know, he's kind of right. They did lie about this and they did lie about that. You know, why is this so now? Why now is this working? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't seem to me that there is an, another answer for him on the right. I don't see anybody else stepping up in true sense, but we can talk about that in a second. That's because Trump's a cult leader and nobody else can in, in the States. <laughs> there's no space for anyone else. I mean, DeSantis, the governor of Florida, is trying very hard, but he doesn't have the charisma. He's like very wooden. I did a, I did a piece uh, in my uh, Substack newsletter, Lucid, about uh, DeSantis trying to have a personality cult on Instagram, and it just it's like doesn't work because he's just he doesn't like people. Now Trump Trump is a showman, and a lot you know I found in my research a lot of these uh, the successful strongmen come from a background of communications. They really know how to relate to a crowd, male and female. Um, so like Mussolini was a journalist, Mobutu is in my book, super interesting figure of the Congo. Very interesting, very deadly charming. He was a journalist. Uh, you know, Berlusconi uh, was a, a television, he owned television networks. And of course, Trump is a marketer as well as a television person. So he has this charisma. So there's two parts. The one is like, why is there, uh, why is this so appealing to men right now? And one of the most interesting things I found as a pattern was these strong men figures and the idea of like a, a certain kind of gender ideology appeals when societies have had a lot of change. And it could be uh, often it's like gender relations, more gender equity. Um, it could be racial emancipation. It could be workers' rights. But uh, let's just stick to the gender stuff because we're talking about masculinity. So recurrently, there's this feeling that men are losing status in society. And so when, whenever you have authoritarians, and it's true today, there's like a three-part kind of gender politics. One is hypermasculinity. You got to puff up the man. So, so you had like Tucker Carlson made that really strange video of like an Aryan body and you can like put a testicle warmer and like increase your God knows what. I mean, there's all kinds of weird stuff. DeSantis re released a video, it's now deleted, where he compared himself to a wolf and to an, he's a predator. So the idea of the man as predator, the idea of the man should be able to do anything he wants and not be challenged by women. And then you have the hypermasculinity where you show the body as like a you know formidable uh, like image, right? So that's hypermasculinity. Second is misogyny. It comes so you got to put women down. For you to feel like a true man, you've got to put women down, and that leads into uh, you know taking away reproductive rights, uh, 
you know, female autonomy. The third leg of it is homophobia because only some male identities are okay. And so the through line of authoritarianism, like the true through line is homophobia. They all persecute gays, uh, LBG, LBGTQ the range today we say, but in 20th century, like fascist years, uh, just talked about quote homosexuality. They all persecute gays um, around the world. So that's the three. So, so when in our country, uh, there was this perfect storm of things that led people to have support for like a Trump figure and all of his cronies who are just because people didn't like it that there was an African-American president for eight years. They didn't like it that, you know, same-sex marriage has been legalized. Women were admitted to combat for the first time. Like other countries, women have been fighting in combat for ages. Women were admitted to the special forces. They didn't like any of that. <laughs> and we had like Hillary Clinton. It was a nightmare for them, right? So Trump's like, I'm going to turn the clock back. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to show that you can do anything to women and get away with it. So that lawless masculinity, that's super important. It was important to Mussolini, who is a serial rapist. It was important. They're all like that. Mobutu used to sleep with, uh, you know, the wives of his officials to show that he and he alone was like, he could do it all. So that's part of, that's, that's part of what we're going through now. Unfortunately, it's like a cycle of everybody wants to talk about masculinity um, and often not in a very productive way, I would say. Right. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in pushing towards hyper masculinity and misogyny and all those, all those things, they clearly, I mean, any hyper, any extreme uh, foregoes the other side. And, and what I find, and I was just having this discussion the other day is that, you know, when you have an actualized woman or man, they have a good balance, right? You know, a very strong and good man that you would want to say is a good role model has a good, what we would characterize as, uh, you know, in, in let's say Eastern philosophy would be that yin and yang, right? That, yeah. that yin and that, that gentle, tender side. And same for a woman. She would not be so far yin or this classical, stereotypical mother figure. She would also have, you know, what we would consider this yang part and it would be good and well and well and balanced and it's it's clear to me that the people that have had lasting and good quality let's say peaceful success because there have been many autocrats and and many authoritarian leaders that have you know let's say been in power for a very long time but had to do some turbulent and crazy and chaotic things to keep their power you know um from saddam hussein to you know executing all these they're all executing people right you know as soon as they get into power and executing people that have helped them or whatever that seems that's a classic thing which is it's oh, kind yeah. of crazy. Uh, Even their own families. But, yeah, go ahead. It, it <laughs> seems crazy. Yeah. I, I know that's normal, but uh, did, did you want to say something? Go ahead. If you, no, if uh, no. It's just that the, it's called eating your own, that you, you get to power and then you execute or jail or whatever, depending on the severity. But you turn against everybody around you and you become more paranoid. And so the secret of the strongman is that these are weak people. These are insecure people. And you look at Putin today where he's, it's not just because he's afraid of COVID or whatever. He's got to be, he has a special bulletproof train. They all end up in these bunkers, you know, or forms of bunkers. Uh, and because they're afraid, they're afraid of everything. Um, and I write it, that was one of the most interesting parts to, the, to write the book, the, the endings chapter, where I have a, a, a thing about how afraid they are of everybody around them, including uh, the people they govern. And that's super. And so that's not, that's not very strong. <laughs> that's right, not. right. That doesn't end up being strong. It becomes a, the satirical thing where they pop out into public and they puff their chest out and they, you know, have people doing this and then they return quickly to the bunker and hide away from everyone, you know, and wait for this end because a lot of their endings are just horrendous. Horrible. I mean, there's yeah. some of the worst endings that you could ever write from Gaddafi to uh, Saddam Hussein, you know, uh, Hitler, they're all just horrifically bad. And uh, so I'm curious if you could, because I just want to touch on one. I have, uh, we have some people in our company from all over the world, but we do have some Ukrainians. And I actually lived in Ukraine for a very short period of time. This is maybe not directly up on your, in your subject, but do you have any idea on how this could play out? Or if you could get into, into Putin's head right now, because we already had the attempt 
at uh, what was a coup or isn't a coup or what's going on. Like, you know, we have to play with this whole, you know, the fog of war and trying to understand what's really going on. But how do you see this playing out from his aspect? You know, does he look at the chessboard and see a whole bunch of moves or is he just truly as we're all, you know, as a lot of the media wants to, to play on our fears, is he just waiting for that moment where he can say, I've lost, boom, nuke, or, you know, anything that will keep me in power or safe? How do you think he's thinking? I'm glad you mentioned safety. Uh, oh, I'm in his head uh, because he's in my book. He's one of my protagonists of my book. And if you study, if you live in these guys' heads, and I don't recommend it, it's awful because they're awful people. But you can predict what they're going to do sometimes. And so, uh, since you asked me, so do you remember that Biden and Putin had a summit in Geneva, like summer of 2021? I, I, get, I get like a sixth sense about these guys. And I knew uh, that Putin was feeling more vulnerable. That there were a lot of polls showing, and you know, Russian polls, you have to take them with a grain of salt. But they showed that like young people, ages 18 to 24, 50% of them thought that Russia wasn't going in the right direction. Um, and this is before the war started. There were, a lot of, there were a lot of signs that he has a kleptocracy and it's not sustainable. He's just stealing, it's institutionalized theft. It's just the whole system he set up is not sustainable. The other thing is we forget Putin's been there as long as Mussolini was now, over 20 years. So that's like a point at which a lot of them if they make it that far, something happens. So anyway, Putin sits there. He's sitting there with Biden. And of course, he's made to look like Biden's equal. And he's sitting there. And you know, he's got like that plastic face. You never know what he's saying, thinking. But I got a really bad feeling. And, and then he had a press conference. And the U.S. Uh, journalist grilled him. And you could see he was kind of pissed. So I couldn't sleep that night. <laughs> and I wrote a piece for my newsletter. And I said, you know, this was, Biden thought this would like guarantee stability having this, but he could become very reckless. And so soon after that, he starts, they have all these things with China and they start saying, oh, it's the new multipolar word. Okay, so that's the background. Then, so he invades, right? He invades Ukraine. Uh, three days after the war started, I wrote an op-ed for MSNBC uh, predicting everything I wrote has happened, that it was going to go badly. It was going to backfire. It was going to show his weakness because uh, there's a syndrome. I started to talk about before. These guys, the longer they stay in power, the more paranoid they get. So they surround themselves with flatterers, with family members, with sycophants, and they don't have objective input. And they start believing their own propaganda, they're too much in their bunkers, you know, they're isolated. That's when they make mistakes. And Mussolini, there's actually interesting parallels. Like Mussolini went, you know, he was already allied with Hitler. All of his generals told him not to enter the war uh, in 1940. They waited a year. And he's like, no, it's going to be fine. He didn't listen. So Putin didn't, we know now, but I knew already. It was like he didn't listen to his generals. He didn't consult them. He also didn't game out the economic sanctions effects. He just, he's just acting out of his own arrogance. So that's why if you go back, if you find that article in MSNBC, I think it's called like Putin thinks he's the hero, but like it's not, it's not gonna work. Um, you'll be astonished. And what has happened is that this war has exposed the total corruption and ruination of Russia from his kleptocracy so that the military this is what happens. They plunder the military. They have crappy rations. They have antiquated weapons. It's just like fascist Italy. I feel like it's repeating. So to answer your question, in fascist Italy, the war went so badly that Mussolini's own people staged a coup against him. His own fascist grand council voted him out. And then Hitler rescued him and he had a few more years as a puppet of Hitler. Fine. So Putin... You know, we have this Prigozhin mutiny, um, and he's just much more weak. And even before the mutiny, which showed the important thing about the mutiny is it showed that the 
the, the Russian police and security forces were not rushing to defend Putin. And that's sending a message to a lot of people uh, that he's not as strong as, you know, his propaganda said. So he, I don't know exactly how it will happen, but if the war continues to go badly, um, he's kind of a marked man. And it, it, it would appear that the longer it goes, the less good this is, right? I mean, we were all under the, it was a shock to most of the world that, that it was going to happen. And then we all assumed that Ukraine would fall, what, within a few weeks, right? That was kind of this, this idea that potentially something was going to happen rather quickly. And now here we are all this time after. And the longer it goes, I understand it's, it's, it's a war of attrition, kind of this. And it doesn't seem, you know, this is not an infinite thing. This is clearly not going to go on uh, forever uh, for Putin. It doesn't, it doesn't bode well for him. Um, clearly, it doesn't bode well for the Ukrainians and, uh, as well. But I, that not knowing that it would unite most of the world uh, or that they would at least work together in some, some way to you know, come against him. He's not just fighting Ukraine. It's, it's ended yeah. up being this world versus you where he didn't really have that issue or problem before the invasion. I mean, to some degree, geopolitically, yes, Russia's always kind of been that that gray zone, but out and out enemy, uh, you know, wasn't wasn't there. And so, uh, in these guys, they they have this idea, right, that they can, as you say, when they get isolated from the truth and from objective reality, they start to make mistakes. And so, my question then becomes, bringing it back to the U.S., we've had Trump, and he has his you know his his uh, commonalities with many of these. Uh, dictators and, and leaders, what's the answer? What's the, what's the opposite to, to that? Because as it stands now, I, I see sometimes some news titles and some, some headlines that want to make it out to seem like Trump isn't popular or he, he's not necessarily there. And I don't know that that's necessarily true. And then when I look to say, well, what is the, what's the opposite side say? What, are, what, is, what is the Democrat side doing about it? What is the answer? Yeah, great question. Um, so the, the hopeful part of this is um, the media doesn't really cover this, but this is going to be my next book. We're living through a global renaissance of nonviolent mass protest. Like places like Iran, you know, you can, you can go through around the world. Places either that never have, uh, they're either the biggest protests in the nation's history, that's Israel. Like right now, all of the, they're, they're losing the, the defense forces, the security, 150 tech companies just gave uh, their people the day off so they can protest Netanyahu, that's going on. Iran, it, this is an enormous protest in Iran, even China. Those protests actually uh, against the COVID lockdowns last uh, November, were a huge deal. 79 universities had protests. And it's just not like there's a reason the Chinese don't want us to remember this. Even uh, Xi Jinping's uh, alma mater, which is like an elite incubator, they had a big protest. So all over the world, and in our country, uh, we don't talk about the Women's March anymore, but that was to protest Trump. It was the largest march in American history. The, and it had an effect on mid, the midterm elections the next year. Then it was surpassed by Black Lives Matter, which was by a huge measure, the largest social movement and protest in American history. Up to 20 million people <laughs> were involved in some kind of Black Lives Matter uh, event. And it was multi-generational because often it's young people. They're always like out there in the barricades and they are the, the, the core. But a lot of these protests, including Black Lives Matter, the multiracial and multigenerational, um, was the same in Brazil. It's just that, and there's like a lot of labor actions going on around the, the U.S. and elsewhere. So we're living through this whole um, reaction against authoritarianism, and and reaction against like billionaires plundering everything. That's what a lot of the climate stuff. So, so there there are interesting things going on in the states. Uh, in Florida and Tennessee, there are like these new alliances of state lawmakers who have like, you know, De DeSantis is trying to have like an authoritarian model there. He's, he's succeeding. 
And so you've got these uh, alliances between grassroots activists and state lawmakers. That's super interesting. Like Justin Pearson doing, you know, in Tennessee, they're doing the black power symbol in the House of Representatives in Tennessee. That's, that's interesting. So this is the, th there's stuff going on. It, it, we have such an enormous country. It hasn't like coalesced, but I think that we're ripe for another round of uh, whatever. It's going to look, it always looks different, right? Of something, because uh, I think you should never underestimate the American people. That's one of my like mantras. Um, Definitely. Definitely. I mean, uh, I find that interesting. I mean, the, the, what's come of a lot of these, let's say nonviolent protests or just these movements in, in general, I think you're right. It's yet to be seen. It doesn't seem like they're connected, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, we're only a few years away from what was that, that movement. And when we look back in history, they're, they're not going to really going to separate too much a five year period, uh, you know, within, you know, the, the history books. And so what I'm also curious, because and, and you, I don't know if you've touched on this before, and so this, this question's a little bit out there, but the authoritarian uh, mindset, uh, identity and stuff in the corporate world and how it blends with um, politics and stuff. How does that play out? Because we have a really unique thing in U.S. You have people not calling Elon Musk an authoritarian leader, uh, or but people with immense power. In Russia, you have the oligarchs, right? And, and um, mm -hmm. Putin has to manage these people in a certain way. Definitely, there's some form of this going on. I mean, the corporations that we have there are controlled by a few more or less men who are in power for a very long time, mm -hmm. who want certain things, and it's you know, not to be conspiratorial about it, but that they have wants and needs and different things and they have the ability to squash things and they use propaganda and totally. they want certain things. How does that play out between, you know, a nation like this? Yeah, that's such a good question. We, they are kind of, they are in their own way oligarchs. Um, it's different because they're not uh, dependent on the leader and the leader changes, thank God, because we're a democracy. Right. But because uh, of the influence of these people over politics, we've had all this news recently about how the Supreme Court is a completely corrupt and bought institution by these billionaires like Harlan Crow. And, you know, and it's like every every uh, conservative justice has somebody quipped has his own billionaire <laughs> who's like sponsors him. And then the whole January 6th thing. Uh, the fact that uh, Justice Thomas, his wife, uh, is, was like an active conspirator for January 6th. And they have such power, they're able be, to be shielded, Ginny Thomas. She was like actively corresponding with all of these kind of, you know, right wing. Uh, there's an enormous universe of right wing, uh, very influential think tanks, the Heritage Foundation, you know, all kinds of Federalist Society and that's what's scary about our moment. Before I said the positive stuff about uh, a, a reaction, but if a third of my book is about coups, and I never thought it was going to be useful to the states, but I'm so glad I learned all about coups because we've got this whole landscape of people who are working very hard to to get Trump back in office and finish what he started, which is he he wants to wreck democracy internally. And he wants to, to finish taking America out of the democratic framework internationally and align it with autocracies. And what he's, there's a reason, this is like another one of these things, we might want to laugh at this. Like every other day, Trump is now like, oh, Xi Jinping, uh, you know, leader of North Korea, uh, leader of Russia, they're top of the line people, he calls them. And, and he used to do this like maybe once every few months. No, I'm telling you, he's doing it like every three days. Everywhere he goes, he's talking about how fabulous these murderous dictators are. And the reason he's doing it is that Trump is a superb propagandist. When we look back, like maybe we'll be dead by the time people figure this out, but I, I think I figured it out because that's what I study. He is one of the most important propagandists of the 21st century. He truly is. 
he's brilliant at that. I, I don't like the man at all, as you, as you know, but he's a brilliant propagandist and he knows that you have to repeat and repeat. So what he's been doing is re-educating the American people to think that autocracy is good and that those leaders are actually top of the line people. He says they're at the top of their game. Well, what's the game? The game is stealing, killing. Like North Korea is like a cybercrime uh, conglomerate. That's like they're criminal states. <laughs> and he's a criminal though, so that works for him. So, um, and he's a criminal. There's been never been anyone like Trump, uh, Republican or Democrat. He's a criminal in so many ways. It's quite astonishing. Um, that that he was president. Um, and so when you have somebody like that, it just, everything changes. Do you, I find it really interesting that half of, and I agree with you on the propaganda side, it seems to be one of the things that he is truly good at and he understands that he's good at. When you see him up in front of a crowd, he knows the crowd is, he is on beat. They are com in complete flow you know, in sync, and you know that he, he truly gets it. What I find interesting is that we also have this image of him or we're displayed an image of him also as kind of a blundering idiot. And I don't know where that's also coming from uh, because my question to you is, which one do we believe, right? Is, is he a master strategist? Does he not even understand what he's doing? We know that he understands he's good at a crowd and that he enjoys being good with the crowd. But does he think more than one step ahead? Because the to keep it simple, what we've done, when people look at Putin, people we, we love to glorify him as a master strategist who, you know, that's the kind of thing that he's given off and that he knows every step and he's he's all knowing and all his his stuff. And Trump had this other part to him. And I don't know if that's because of the U.S. and it's uh you know, two party system. And it's not necessarily that regime that can just block off all of this. And so we have this blundering idiot image and this uh, master propagandist image who is all this. Which one do you truly believe when he's alone and sitting there? I mean, I, he doesn't strike me as a guy that likes to read books. I don't no, know. He doesn't read. And I don't, I don't know if he studies history or I, I, so I don't understand. What do you think? That's such a good question. Well, first of all, just a quick preface with Putin. This whole war is a testament to how these guys spin these narratives about themselves as, again, I'm going to do it all. I'm a modernizer. I'm the strategist. And it's all BS. Uh, because in the meantime, we saw the condition of the military and other stuff we talked about before. So what they are is opportunists. And because they, you have to get into their personality, uh, because they have no moral code, none, they will be anything you need them to be. They will ally with anyone. And that's why all of these guys, and this was true with Mussolini, so this has not changed, okay, for like 100 years. You think, well, how come they've got, you know, gangsters, housewives, the church, whatever the church is in their area, uh, and not just, uh, often it's multiple faiths. Trump, Trump is the most uh, impious, shall we say, amoral being uh, ever to grace American politics practically. And he got both evangelical Christians and Orthodox Jews to say that he's there in office by the will of God. And it was the same with Mussolini who hated the church, he was an atheist, and he's the one who brokered the deal with the Vatican. You've got the Russian Orthodox Church. Every time Putin, Putin goes and has an ice bath, they're there to like bless him. So these are, these are people who are opportunists, and they're very good at seizing the moment. They do have some basic values, and they, their goals are to get, they know what they want. Uh, and then they depend on their advisors to work out like right now, Trump's circle is working out this very scary plan to purge, you know, civil service. By the time he, if he gets in, it's he's got a plan worked out. What he knows how to do is manipulate people, seduce people, um, and that means elites as well as uh, all the cheering crowds, and to take advantage of everyone and everything at the right time. So they don't have to read, and they are different this way, like. 
Mobutu and Mussolini were very learned, actually, and they were multilingual and they were different. But they had the same personality in terms of like, you'll do anything to get to power and anything to keep yourself in power. Even, even that's how the United States had a coup on January 6th. Uh, that was a coup attempt um, because Trump and I, I in my book, I, I kind of anticipated that Trump would not be leaving office quietly if he lost because it's impossible for them to do that. That's just not how they're they're built. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The transfer of power, it doesn't make sense. It goes against essentially. Right. The, the, <laughs> the rhetoric that they'd been saying from before they're in office to while they're in office that they can, that they know what's best and they are what's best for the country. So it doesn't make sense for them to just go, okay, well, I guess I lost. So here, you know, you can, you can, you can, you can run the the country now. And you, you spent a lot of time in, in Italy. And so this now just kind of jogged my memory. The church is another fascinating place over the, the course of all of human history and the way that the Vatican is run. I mean, it's a, I don't know. Do we call that a democracy? Because right, the bishops they choose the no. pope. I, I think if, if I'm, is it no? Well, how does it work? That part, that part is there's a there's a special body that chooses the pope, and then you have the white okay. the white smoke that comes out. But as an institution, right. uh, the the Vatican, like many religious institutions, is quite authoritarian. Um, in, in its, That's what I was getting at. Yes, it is. And in, in fact, I'm glad you brought this up because one of the sad things that happens when these guys uh, have success is that certain religious traditions, like progressive religious traditions or, or progressive faiths or just progressive priests or pastors, they get sidelined or they actually end up in jail or whatever. And it's the authoritarian characters and institutions that back and flourish like Putin's giving the Orthodox Church a ton of money to restore its old churches they get they do these deals it's called authoritarian bargains and they do these deals with each other and so it's really sad like in, in Italy uh, before Mussolini came in and he was a he was in a prime minister of a democracy for a few years before he became dictator there was a new party that was a Christian socialist party by this incredible guy, uh, Don Sturzo, was a progressive priest. And it became the third largest party like overnight in Italy. The Vatican was freaked out about this because they didn't want a progressive faith tradition. So they conspired with Mussolini to shut down this party and Sturzo, this head, had to go into exile. And that was the background to them doing their big deal, the Lateran Accords, where the church and state, you know, they made their deal and then everything was fine, more or less. They had some moments, it wasn't, they had arguments, but they, the point is that you, they get rid of the faith traditions. And I think in our country, we have such powerful progressive faith traditions and so many powerful uh, protagonists, like Reverend Warnock, who's a senator. He's also a reverend. There's a lot of people. Reverend Barber, William Barber, I'm a huge fan of, of his. And I think that that has to be activated more for us to oppose uh, autocracy here. I see. So, yes, the essentially the addition of new ideas, progressive ideas, and the empowerment of people who are um, proliferating those ideas will allow us to put some sort of balance. The point is uh, that, I, that I wanted to get is that that makes sense, you know, that we would need that push from somebody and that they would want to squash that. I've seen that in different and other um, uh, elections, let's say, that I've been in, involved in, not for myself running for any office, but within the, the sport world. And I find it really interesting that the um, human nature, as, as it is, runs around in all of these organizations. You know, we're talking about these regimes in, in, the, in the Vatican or in the church and in, in the corporate world and in, in politics, you know, despite the country, right? They all run some sort of similar thing. What is the end game? Because you kind of touched on that a little. <clears throat> but you, staying in, getting power and staying in power seems like an end. For somebody who isn't after that, it seems kind of boring. It just seems like a title that is just made up. I mean, I understand the trappings of power. I understand 
what they can do with it. They get the money and they can tell people what to do and they can attack this country and do whatever. But what's the real, what is truly motivating most of these guys uh, <laughs> from their core, if you could? Good question. These, these are, um, some are sociopaths and some are narcissists. I don't use those terms in my book because I'm not a mental health professional, but they have a mania of, um, because they're insecure, they have a mania to be able to control everything and everyone at all times. And no matter how much adu adulation they have and how many people they can steal from, they always want more. So they're never happy. And, and that's why inevitably, the longer they're in power, um, they get more repressive. They don't get more secure and more democratic or even just more um, humane toward the people who support them, they get more repressive. That's when they can be like turning on people who helped them at the beginning or there's usually purges at the beginning, but then there's usually another round of purges because they start feeling unsettled or they see a rival. And so uh, one of the worst things you can be is too competent or too popular uh, if you work for these guys and there's a there's a it's not funny at all, but there's a story uh, with Italian fascism. There was this guy uh, who was a squadrist, a, a killer, and he came up with Mussolini, Italo Balbo. He was a world class aviator and he did these transatlantic flights that got him on the cover of time. He was a world hero. He flew for the first time from like, you know, I don't know, New York to Rome to like Brazil and to New York. There's even streets named after him still in Chicago today. Well, that was no good for Mussolini. And he is also very handsome and he was not bald and he was younger. <laughs> so, so Mussolini uh, demoted him as Minister of Aviation right after he became like a world you know, hero and sent him to Libya as the governor of Libya to get him out. Um, and that was considered like a big demotion. Uh, and that's what they do. Or, or they, they kill them. Um, you know, they have a purge. They send them into prison. So this is also like, these, are, these, these regimes are like a race to the bottom because the nature of the, the authoritarian personality is that they can't be happy for others to flourish. And they don't really want excellence. They want loyalty. So what's, to go back to what's motivating them, is just total control and feeling safe. They they need to feel safe, and that's why, you know, they they have the bunkers and the palaces, um, but it never really works. Right. Yeah. It it ends up being this search, this existential search for some sort of uh, safety yeah. that they don't have within themselves, and so they try to create it outside. Um, and I want to go back to something you said, which isn't normally controversial. But uh, I want to know your thoughts on this because I've seen some interesting uh, research, let's say, on it. Obviously, you said the U.S. is a democracy. And every once in a while, I'll see the headlines that'll, that'll push and say, well, we're a democracy, but we're kind of a republic, you know, because of X, Y, and Z. Or we're kind of, yeah, I don't want to call it a monarchy in a certain sense because we, have to, we don't really have a king, but we, we've kind of knighted or, you know, donned these people to be the ones to decide even though technically we didn't really decide. And so the seat of power in the U.S., which is really interesting, isn't always and necessarily, like we said, we had these you know, billionaires sponsoring certain politicians or bankrolling their entire thing, and it's like, who's in control here? Can you do something that is against the guy who gave you the money to get into the seat? You know, Or are you compromised in a certain, certain sense? And so... I'm curious what you actually think about those people that are outside that are going to evade your scrutiny of an authoritarian regime. Uh, what do you what do you think of them? Because they exist, right? And you said you're not, you know, a clinical psychologist, for instance, and you don't use a psychopath or something like this. But those people exist in the shadows, and they wield some sort of power. Yeah, and they probably have similar goals and similar ideas for control. What do you make of their relationship and role within yeah. our society? Yeah, um, I think the whole Trump era has been 
a huge wake up call uh, to many Americans and people who love America from abroad. Because the whole thing, like, it can't happen here. It can't happen here because America is too much of a democracy. You know, everybody comes here to seek freedom from other countries, all this. And I, I see America from the lens of like, almost like a global history. And for me, for example, uh, America was not a democracy until everybody could vote. So our democracy in, and I don't, of course it was a democracy, the democratic institutions were established hundreds of years ago, but they were, it was a very limited thing. But until civil rights legislation passed in the 1960s, it was not a democracy. And so um, it's very new actually. Multi, we're a multiracial democracy. This is our uh, winning point. <laughs> And yet that's a very new experiment uh, from the 60s. That's relatively recent, um, which is why it's been so fragile and there's so much backlash. However, that said, this issue of the kind of billionaires, we could call them oligarchs and the dark money, and also the way that uh, I think that this whole era now too, with now Trump is gone, but the GOP in all these states has been uh, souping up its attempts to make these like state autocracies, right? And so there's a, a colleague of mine, I've had him on my, uh, my web show for my newsletter, David Pepper. He was the former chair of the Ohio Democratic Party. He wrote a book called Laboratories of Autocracy. And I, it really opened my eyes, because again, I'm not a historian of America. I, I didn't know how bad things were. And he said, there are states, and Ohio is one of them, you cannot call it a functioning democracy because people's votes don't count because of gerrymandering, redistricting, all these tricks. Um, and, and so between the amount of dark money and the, like the gun lobby, for example, and you, know, the, you can think, you can have different opinions on your right to own a handgun uh, or whatever to protect your property. But I'm talking about like money flows. The fact that uh, a lot of GOP politicians, they are essentially fully bankrolled uh, by the gun lobby. In other countries, we would call these people arms dealers. So I'm also trying to find always the correct language, which is often taken from other countries to capture the unique things about the United States. Um, and again, whatever you feel about your right to have uh, a handgun or something, this is a structural issue, as is the dark money and the billionaires. And they're connected uh, because these people support, uh, they, they, let's put it this way, they don't mind that there's a higher toll of mass gun violence than elsewhere because they have, uh, I think, um, I wrote a, an op-ed for the Washington Post uh, said, saying that gun violence uh, as an outcome, the trauma as an outcome, uh, can prime us for authoritarianism because it makes you view schools are places of fear and suspicion. All of the places where people would be mixing different races, different cultures, they, they, there's a whole line of that. So these are things that are quite unique about America. The gun issue, um, the fact that people think it can't happen here, um, and the degree to which billionaires are not taxed. Other countries have higher tax rates for billionaires. So we have some structural problems that are not helping us in this moment. That's, that's my long answer to, to, it kind of qualifies the idea that we're just like this great democracy. Yeah. And this last follow-up since we're almost, uh, done here, and I know this isn't always a very, very difficult thing to do to predict the future, but I'm going to ask you, if Trump wins the election, do you feel that we are in for some serious trouble because it's the second time around and that he will get him and whoever is essentially um, with him will get to finish, like you said, what they had hoped to start? Do you believe that that's true or do you, do you find that to be fantasy a lot of the world makes it seem like a lot of our worries you have a very deep understanding of 
of all of these men and what they've done throughout society. And I'm sure in every authoritarian regime, they thought that it was a not here or maybe this couldn't happen or they didn't see it coming, let's say. And so whenever it does happen in a place that has had democracy for a while or a different style of government, I'm sure it comes as, as a surprise or it sneaks up on them. Do you really believe or are we in danger, let's say, of something like that truly happening should Trump get into office? We, we are. And I'm not saying that lightly. Um, for example, I was one of I was very uh, I didn't use the fascist word to, to uh, with Trump. And uh, many people almost pressured me to use the fascist word. And I didn't want to use it because I felt like people think of fascism and they think of a one party state and, you know, everything suppressed. And so hey, I'm speaking out, you know, um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm quite cautious about these things. However, uh, when these guys get out of office and they come back, they're, they're full of revenge. They're full of, uh, they're in a big hurry. One of the reasons Hitler did everything so quickly um, uh, and is because he saw Mussolini have instant success. Mussolini founded fascism in 1919, and like three years later, he was prime minister. And Hitler was very frustrated. It took him so long. So when he finally got in, he was like, boom. <laughs> we're do a matter of months. So when Trump says we're going to do everything in six months, I believe him. And that's why... The fact he's got armies of people, there was a New York Times article that talked about the whole plan for purging tens of thousands of people who will be fired from the civil service, um, all kinds of things. He's got this army of people making up these plans like two years early. And so he's going to be all ready. Now, will he be able to do everything? Will he be able to have like Michael Flynn, this crazy general wants martial law? I don't think they'll be able to do some of those things, but he will have the power to use executive decrees and, and all kinds of things. Um, and there's no accident that he's been telling us for years that he wants to be like Putin. He wants to be like Xi. And there's nothing to counterindicate that. And because we're always, we always think we're not prepared and we always think it's not going to be that bad. And then it is that bad or it's worse because you, these guys specialize in doing things you couldn't have imagined. Nobody expected January 6th. Who would expect that a president or uh, and even or you would target your own vice president for for harm? Mike Pence. Nobody wants to talk about that. I talk about it every day. I think about it every day that that's like Saddam Hussein stuff where you target. We've been talking about this. <laughs> yeah. Here's like Mr. Super right wing fundamentalist, hates gays. He's not a liberal. And yet, because he didn't do what Trump wanted to do, he, he was targeted. There was a noose out for him on Capitol Hill to hang him. So this is stuff where people are like, oh, I didn't see that coming. So this is why, this is why if he comes back, we could be toast in terms of our, our freedoms. Um, and and I, I don't say that lightly. Um, and last thing, just before we, we, we finish up, do you feel that the charges and the indictments and all the things that he's currently facing, one would be, it would, it would appear on the outside that the idea is to potentially make it impossible for him to run, whether that's politically motivated or not, I really don't know. In my head, just being simply logical, I would see someone who, let's say, is on another party, if they would have the ability to, or if they had some sort of grudge against Trump, or even had you know, feelings like you, that he is a potential threat, they would want to do everything in their power to make sure that not only can he not become president, but he can't even run. Let's squash the fire out here. Do you think that any of these things will be a, an issue for him going forward? Because the impeachment seemed to only embolden him once yeah. it, it seemed, and he could stand in, with a piece of paper and say, look, I'm, you know, they can't stop me and hold up a paper. So what do you think this would actually do? Um, in the short term, uh, it's just going to make him, it's not going to hurt his popularity at all. And he said he would, he'll run if he's convicted. Um, and he would. Nothing's going to make him stop running. 
Um, Because that's how these guys are. That's why they, normal people don't want to run for office while they're under investigation, much less indicted, twice impeached, but that they're not normal people. The whole point that you asked about, about the end game, the whole point, the end game is you've got to get, if you're corrupt, you've got to get into power and shut down judicial independence. We have a lesson now in Israel. That's what Netanyahu did. Right. He, he was voted out. He was still had these terrible corruption charges, terrible from his point of view. And he gets back in with new extremist partners. And then he goes after the judicial system. He's like laser focused on that to make his charges go away. And it hasn't worked out. So, I mean, he's just done it. But there's huge protests and all the things we said before. In case of Trump, because he poses as a victim, people love him and they think that he's being unfairly victimized and he set everything up. So he doesn't have any reason to drop out uh, no matter what happens to him. Incredible. (laughs) Uh, Ruth, we will link to everything. Obviously this is a subject that I could ask you questions on all day, but uh, we'll definitely have to do this again as things develop down the road. Um, We will link to everything. Strongmen, I absolutely recommend it. I'm probably, let's say, a third of the way through the book right now, guys. So check that out. We'll link to that as well. Um, is there anywhere else that you would like to send people that are going to be interested in what you have to say? Um, uh, well, who knows what's going on with Twitter, but I'm on uh, all social media <laughs> platforms at Ruth Ben Giat. Uh, and then I have a sub stack. I actually I write, uh, write for MSNBC, I write for CNN, but I have a Substack uh, called Lucid, as in like having a clear mind, uh, and that's where I do weekly essays uh, and chats with uh, live chats to talk about all this stuff. It's about the U.S. and it's about the whole world, any kind of threat to democracy. So that's where you can find me. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, we will link to everything down below. Ruth, thanks again, and uh, we'll do this again sometime. I've enjoyed it. Thanks. Uh-huh.